Hello, everybody. Welcome to White Line Fever Live. Uh, we are back. And again, Brian Carney said, make sure you sell at the start of the program. So we've got a very special guest. But first, I want to tell you that tied in with our guest at um, in the shop, which is at wlfmerchandise.com or Um, All Kiwi gear is 15% off with the code BIG O. I haven't set it up yet. I'm going to do it after the show. So don't go there now. Uh, but uh, all New Zealand gear, just about to post a, um, a singlet off now, a Kiwi training singlet now, 15% off with the code uh, Big O. And don't forget to support us on Patreon and read the show notes if you're watching on YouTube um, or, um, or if you're listening, then look at them on the bottom of, the, of your phone screen while, you, while you're listening to us chat. And that uh, has given away who our guest is. Uh, it is the author of the, uh, from a rugby league perspective, I would call it a bestseller. Uh, he'll be able to tell us that. Uh, Big O, the story of Olsen Filipana. It's Patrick Skeen. Hello, Patrick. Uh, good day, Steve. How are you? I'm good, mate. Did you like that sort of cap- bit of capitalism? Um, it doesn't come naturally, but um, I'm doing my best. I know, I know. You've got to, uh, you've got to turn a quid. And I think it's, um, you know, the closest capitalism to your heart, rugby league shirt. So you haven't wandered too far. Yeah, yeah, well, we'll probably get into um, how close and far rugby league uh, uh, travels um, to our heart and away from it uh, during this um, during this little half hour chat, Patrick. But how has the book been going? Uh, obviously, you got a lot of publicity. The book's got its own website. Um, I was just looking at you on Fox Sports before before we came on, and you've been on um, the uh, um, Rugby League Digest as well, which I, I would expect to have a pretty huge following. So, how's the book going? Good, good. We've gone into reprint and we're um, reasonably close to what New York Times would call uh, a bestseller. Mm-hmm. In rugby league terms, as you know, there's not um, there's a very herky-jerky market for books. Sometimes a book will come out of nowhere and it's more um, paying tribute to the player rather than the quality of the, of the writing and half of them don't get read. And then you have books like Joe Gorman's uh, Rugby League Explains Queensland, which is a Michelangelo piece of work and, you know, didn't sell anywhere near um, some of the direct player uh, autobiographies. So um, it's, it's a funny market. I'm lucky enough to have Olsen alive and um, being able to carry the load. And, um, you know, people are quite shocked when they meet him because he's like father time. He was someone that was there very young in our lives and people's eyes bulge when they see him because he's only about five, eight now. He just seems to be the, the shrinking man. <laughs> but I'm just I'm I'm just overjoyed to to have access to a man I believe is a national living treasure in rugby league and for in in the Australian New Zealand relationship his dismantling King Wally for me sits with the underarm in 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 the folklore between the the two countries and he's still still a garbo so I'm honoured to be his scribe and and tell his story and bring it from the margins and and where it was laboured with uh, some stereotypes that I have. Um, really in the book argued to dismantle and put him in, not in Mount Rushmore, but in a very unique place. Very well, very well said. Now, mate, um, I, I just, I heard that when you first came up with this idea, it was because of a story which was uh, on the Guardian website, which um, got an enormous number of views and you start to work on it and your publisher wanted to change the project fundamentally. Is, is that right? Yeah, they, um, Halfway through, they said, we really love the social history side of the Pacific Revolution, which um, the book has three parts to it. It has Olsen, it has the Pacific Revolution, of which, um, you know, you have actually the the best quote of all in the book um, about um, the Pacific Revolution and it being in rugby league's DNA to um, rob from the rich and, and redistribute wealth to the poor. And it's a quote that a lot of people have, have, have come to me about and said that just sums it up. Rugby leagues, you know, the, the Robin Hood of sports. And I, um, it really sets off the Pacific Revolution chapter. We've got Olsen's story. You've got the Pacific Revolution. And I've also tried to uh, create it as a textbook for cultural competence on how to get the best out of Polynesian and Melanesian players who are by latest estimate 48% of the league plus 12% Aboriginal who operate on the same principle. So 60% of the NRL now is regional Indigenous. And the money ball move in rugby league, you can't win a premiership unless you're culturally competent as a coach and as an organisation. And I talked to a lot of 
player agents and they said the three clubs players are prepared to play for unders in and they advise their clients to go towards are Bellamy, Robinson and Bennett. Uh, they're the three culturally competent coaches that um, took over the mantle from Graham Lowe, who was one of the pioneers, and Graham Lowe learned everything from Jack Gibson about ma- personalised man management and the, being the priest, being the father, being the doctor, being this, being the the friend, just really moulding themselves around the player to get the best out of that player. And there's a big part of the books about Frank Stanton and his mistreatment of Olsen. Whereas today's in today's world of players being a, an asset under management, where it's all customised, Frank Stanton, um, you know, just really flogged Olsen to the gristle and uh, didn't get the best out of him, would shout at him. So I, I've tried to provide a textbook. The NRL have bought 60 for all of their um, staff. So they're using it as a, a, a textbook on cultural competence and empathy, which are, um, have just sort of sprung up as being almost the crucial um, parts of a, a, a head coach's um, operations now to, to, to you can't win a premiership unless you're culturally competent. It's, um, it's, it's, it's there in front of our eyes now. You know, um, I don't want to sort of bore listeners and viewers with here's me just about to finish a book, talking to another guy who's got a book out and, and asking about the business too much. But I just wondered, it sounds like, and it looks like to me that you've, you, you know, this has kind of become your job. And, and when the book first came out, you had no idea how it was going to sell or, or how much reward there would be in it for you. Um, what was involved in the decision to sort of jump in both feet into, into doing this sort of promo and into, and to being a kind of um, accomplished and broad speaker on the, on the subject, as opposed to, Hey, I've just done a book. Now I'll go and do another book or now I'll go and write a feature for someone or, you know what I mean? Like what made you yeah, decide yeah. to sort of get to be so committed to it? Well, there's a permission piece that started for me in um, 2006. I started my own company working with 100 multicultural communities across Sydney, um, doing a lot of sport. And I, I ran the first ever uh, Pacific Community Enga- official Pacific Community Engagement for Kids program with the, the NRL back in 2007. So I've been working with the Pacific community a long time. And then... You know, it's basically the step I was writing for The Guardian. Um, and my original plan with The Guardian was to write 20 articles and whichever one took off, I would I would step up out of sort of 2020 and move towards Test Match and, and take the plunge. Olsen's went wild. It was, this, I think, the second biggest story in The Guardian that year produced by, and it just went, reverberated through Facebook where a lot of league and, and Polynesian and Maori people, um, that's, that's their platform. And they shared it like crazy. No one knew about the racism. Olsen just disappeared in 1980 from New Zealand and um, no one really knew much about him. There's a big gulf between our countries, a lot bigger gulf than, uh, well, particularly back then, we weren't trading partners. And um, so I just took that step and I was also rolled. Olsen was my hero. I remember him. My grandmother, my Irish grandmother lived in um, Lilyfield and we would walk to the hill with our cardboard to slide down the back of the Leichhardt Hill. And it was Larry Corowa, Wayne Wigan and Olsen that I found the most exciting players. And I remember the whole hill would stand up. I didn't know what was going on. Whenever Olsen or Larry got the ball, the whole hill just would stand up in unison. Plus they were different. You know, I grew up in, you know, in, in Anglo Australia and these guys were offering something different, a different look, a different feel. Olsen always played with a smile. And I just fell in love with the guy. But I've sat in a thousand pubs as you have and just heard the guy just derided as an enigma that didn't get it, lazy. And it didn't marry with what I saw of him. I saw him devastate defences. I thought he was amazing. So like a forensic detective, I dug down and went through every single rugby league week. Um, you know, you've been in the, in the museum there where you just got to go through every big league, every rugby league week, talk to everybody. I've got them all in my storeroom, mate. They're all in my storeroom. I don't need to go to the museum. I do have to go to yeah. Sydney, which is 20,000 kilometres away, but, you know. <laughs> yeah. You, got to, you spent time there at some stage. You, you, you've gone through the process, yeah. and it's unmistakable the trends that come out of it. And of the five times he was known as a reserve grader, only played 107 or 108, for, which is still a good, a good career. He spent more time in, in reserves than he should have. 
But four of the five times he was dropped were for disciplinary reasons. They weren't for form reasons. And mm-hmm. Frank Stanton was one of those guys. He'd put you down in reserves for nine weeks. He was, you know, having these mental battles with players to try and break them to his way. And it's just not the best way to get um, good form out of a Polynesian. And once you've lost one of these guys from shouting or abusing or a racist jibe, you never get them back. And there's some coaches now we won't name who've gone very poorly in the last 10 years who've been culturally incompetent and they've lost the Polynesians. And um, that's it. He, the, the, just the, the performance is impacted. Um, yeah, yeah we're going, there's so many rabbit holes now. I'm at an intersection of rabbit holes. Yeah. But, um, the, but Frank Stanton's a guy who, you know, I always got on well with and he was always very nice to me. How did you, uh, and, and again, I'm, unfortunately, I'm not in a position to have read the book, which is, I guess, good in a way because we're hopefully going to sell it. I'm hopefully going to sell it, so it'll be fresh to me yep. um, when, it's, when, it, when it's available and I'll be able to talk about it as I read it but uh, on social media. But how did you go about dealing with that where you've got the main subject of your book is, is telling you a story about someone which is a bit uncomplimentary perhaps? Uh, how do you deal with that? Do you try to make contact with Frank? Does he... You know, like what, what, how do you, and I guess I'm asking that as a journalist and an author. Um, I hope it's as interesting to the viewers and listeners as it is to me, the answer. But um, how do you deal with it? It was one of the worst phone calls of my life, to be honest, that I'll give absolute um, kudos to Frank for stepping into the breach and agreeing to, agreeing to speak. So I, I, I'll, I'll absolutely respect him for that. And um, I'll also note that other players I spoke to or, or read about, thought Frank was the greatest influence in their life and one of the greatest coaches. So he's very, he's been very polarizing. Um, and there was a lot I had to remove or legal removed in, 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 in this book about that time at Balmain as well. Frank, um, you know, basically early into the phone call basically said, I was trying to accuse him of being racist. So that, that was a, a very uncomfortable moment. And Frank's about the same age as my father. So I kind of felt I had my dad in the dock as well. Cause you know, there was a, a very common theme was was ignorance and and fear of of what we don't understand and the outsiders and you, you throw in a seventy year white Australia policy as and just pumping Anglo's up to be um, the chosen ones and everyone else to be inferior and you get the products of that of people distrust outsiders don't think outsiders are as good um, you know treat them as interlopers and Frank wasn't good to Queenslanders um, either whether it was dropping Wally or you know, running Queenslanders out of the Balmain team. He was just into Sydney Rugby League. And we've just seen a bunch of decisions that have come out of Sydney Rugby League that show that we're not, we're never too far from the myopia. Um, and and just the, the being in love with your own backyard so much, you think everyone else is provincial bumpkins. Yeah. Um, and that's that's actually what I was going to go to. And it is, it's, it's an annoying subject to me to even think about at the moment, the whole World Cup thing. But the one thing rugby league may take from the rich and give to the poor as far as state of origin is concerned and, and, and the way our international regulations go, but that creates a product which um, can be sold uh, by, you know, I don't know if we call them, the, I guess we call them the rich, they're in charge, they're running things. So, you know, the, the, as, I, as I said to someone uh, recently trying to explain um, on, on Reddit, once you free the mill workers from the um, um, from the tyranny of the of the pit owners, you can become their new pit owner as long as you just give them a few shillings. Um, and I see that being repeated in international rugby league, particularly uh, where um, we've 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 given people a certain level of agency, and it's become profitable. And now we're just trying to hoard the profits. Um, just like the people we gave them agency from, you know, and 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 um, it, it is it is a it is a disturbing time when um, eighty five percent of players surveyed said they wanted to come to the World Cup, and and that the you know New Zealand particularly who are in the financial control of um, of the um, ARLC and the ARLC, you know, basically step in before too many players speak up um, and and make a decision for them. And then drive that home by having their employers, um, you know, uh, you know, not threaten them, but certainly show disapproval um, of any intention to 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 represent their countries. It's a, it is a dark time, and we're so, we're we're so far back in our journey that 
all other sports are looking at us in the rearview mirror, aren't they? What, what do you think? Yeah, I watched the 100 today, um, Birmingham versus Wales, that 100 cricket thing. The stands were full. They were dancing. And I believe the Northern English crowds would have come out in an extraordinary way to support this, as um, I think it was you that tweeted that, you know, the Aboriginal Maldi team, if they were able to, I don't know, it's not ideal and in line with UN um, classification of a country, but just as a, you know, a little COVID one-off and they would have been greeted like liberators. And we've all seen when the Americans marched into Paris in, in 44, it's one of the great moments of, of people appreciating what another group of people have done. And you know, we could have had something really, really special um, to continue on because unfortunately Peter Vlandy and Andrew Abdo, I don't think they had the experience you had out in New Zealand reporting on, um, you know, or, or just reporting on and knowing what you know and what to that Tonga, the rise of Tonga actually means the whole context of it, unless you're a true, true lover of the international game, it looks like a threat. <laughs> It looks like a threat to the established order. It looks like we have uh, created a Frankenstein in our midst that's risen up from our own bosom to threaten us rather than thinking we've won the thing 10 times. The best mm. thing that could have ever happened to inject, uh, you know, value back into the kangaroos brand would be for it, for it to be beaten in a World Cup, but they don't see that. They're so hell-bent on this global domination piece. It's a Phil Gould's tweet for me. I mean, that's it. They so disrespect the board. I mean, imagine the All Blacks said, "Oh, we don't. Uh, we're going to not. We're going to basically effectively kibosh a World Cup. You can't play it without our brand. It's not the real thing because we don't uh, uh, agree with the people. We don't respect the people of the IRB. It is absolutely preposterous what has happened." And Phil Gould said it, and I love him. I hate him. Whatever. He's the messenger, and he called himself the messenger, and he said, "Don't shoot the messenger." In this tweet, where he said. They basically want to collapse um, and co collapse the International Rugby League um, current infrastructure. So that's the that's the level it's gotten to. Where uh, you know the guy that's got the ear of Peter Vlandis, and Vlandis used the thought we were back in the convict colony as if we were somehow treating the NRL like second class citizens. It's like mate, pony up to the World Cup. We just love the Olympics because. Mate, um, I've lost sound. I don't know if you can hear me, but you've gone very quiet. Um, I just, the other thing is I, I, he used the word uh, to talk about if the Aboriginal team came over here. He actually used the word incarceration to describe their, their quarantine when they got back. Um, it went through to the keeper, but I just thought it was a very poor choice of, of words and it was about being a Modi that was about the, the stuff that has served him well in racing. Um, where he's like, let's take on Melbourne. And it's all adversarial. You know, his entire way of marshalling support is, is adversarial. Uh, and um, unfortunately, you know, rugby league's been caught um, up in it now. Um, the difference is, and I was, I was talking to a friend of mine who talked about the Denver test, and I'm just going to talk a little bit and hopefully your sound comes back, but talking about the Denver test. And the, the NRL clubs saw the players in 2018, the New Zealand and England players, as their IP. We're not going to let a promoter come and take our IP and make money off them. And that, that speaks to the, the heart of this issue too, that they see, you know, 70% of players from the Southern Hemisphere um, uh, as their IP and they see a World Cup in England as someone making money off their employees, their IP, which completely mm -hmm. ignores... The agency of these um, uh, players in all three competition, men, women, and wheelchair, to represent their country, which which is something that remember. Here's a word we haven't heard since the 80s: primacy. Remember, there used to be a saying: the primacy of international football, the primacy of uh, of representative football. It's a dead word. It's something. I, it's a word I haven't heard around uh, rugby league for 30 years. Um, and, yes. and 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 it's, it's the immaturity of the game. Um, to to um, to even judge itself by other sports, the game in the Southern Hemisphere in Australia, to actually look at what other sports are doing and saying, well, actually, they're the standards that apply to us as well. No, we're special. We're better. We're bigger. We don't need to do what those other sports do. 
it's extremely damaging. And but it's something in the game's uh, DNA, and it's something that often makes me feel like I don't want to really devote the rest of my life to it. You know? <laughs> yeah. No, I, I fully understand that, and I had a, a moment of pause. Thank God the Olympics were there just to absor- absorb my angst. I mean, I'd say eighty-five percent of the rugby league community wanted to help their mates in England out. Anyone that's ever been involved in an event, I mean, I, I was uh, my company was in charge of the marketing for the 2017 Rugby League World Cup, and we got about 19,000 Lebanese to Sydney Stadium, and there was about 2,000 Kangaroos fans. It was mm. embarrassing. So they've seen that, and they've just seen that International Rugby League, um, you know, wasn't that sizzling in Sydney. And it's like, well, if you'd brought your 19,000 fans, Kangaroos, we would have had 38,000 fans there, and that's a humming Sydney football stadium. So we've seen um, a depreciation and there's also a drinking of the Kool-Aid when you are the NBA, when you are the EPL, when you are um, the NRL, when you're the leading league, it becomes your property. It becomes, um, I remember, it was a, a really interesting time, but I remember the EPL calling when Tim Kayo was coming across and they were calling our A-League or our doctors over here, which doctors? And that was a little sting mm-hmm. of like looking down at Australian round ball and now we look down on England it used to be you played you know a season you, you alternated between Sydney and UK seasons and it was great and we you know we saw Sturlo and English jerseys used to be sold in Australia as I leaf through old uh, rugby league weeks and we've just let we've just in, but even if they ha- have been weak don't be condescending towards them they're your partners Northumbria we need it for the health and strength of, of, of rugby league and, or it might spread to London, but the heartland, the dirty old town, Salford, and, you know, just up in Cumbria and across the Hull. I mean, that's, that has to be preserved as well. Um, in, in light of a whole range of, 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 of competitive and socioeconomic challenges, but don't be condescending to your partner. I mean, England and Australia are partners and also be, be respectful for HQ. India in cricket is very respectful for England, even though it dwarfs it on the economic side. It's very respectful for England because it's headquarters. And we don't, for, for a lot of people, it started in 1908 and they lose the principles of the why of, of rugby league is the only game ever, ever founded on a principle. And mm. if you don't count the English experience, you don't really know what you're playing for and, and, and why it exists. I, here's what here, here's my you know deep concerns you know getting towards the end of the book um, of two two tribes is that rugby league was um, rugby league was created for people who couldn't afford to play rugby basically they couldn't afford time off work in Australia it was created for people who who wanted to earn get a piece of the pie they didn't they didn't want the people running the rugby competitions to keep all the money right the people who otherwise you know didn't have um, great means it's still selling itself to the descendants in both places of those people and the ab demographic in both places is already occupied by by rugby union so it actually it, it's 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 just in a terminal tailspin it's just going round and round and round it can't in the places it relies on to pay the bills each day, its its path upwards is blocked and permanently blocked, and mm. everyone is everyone is fighting over the over the existing money. So every time we try to go to a new place and and reach people who don't are unaware of the history and judge the sport on its merits, we basically shun them. We give them a taste. And we get rid of them because we can't share the loot. We won't share the loot. And it's just such a, it, it, it is such an ingrained thing in rugby league that I don't see it ever being resolved. And, and yeah. therefore, I think I, I, I find myself going down the path of it not being worthy of my time, you know, because I just can't see uh, any um, um, path for progress. That's the way I feel. I have I have mitig- I have that exact feeling. I have mitigated that this year by devoting my time at Tier Two. Mm. So I've been following every home game of the Kaiviti Silk Tails, the new Fiji team, the Wrong Massey Cup. That has filled me with joy. Every Hanson Park game has filled me with joy. I've been to every North Sydney home game that I could. That's filled me with joy. I went down and saw Gerongong versus Kiama. 
uh, built a whole family holiday around that and just felt absolute joy. So I, I, my love of rugby league, I'm just having to drill one layer below NRL and international right now, which is on hold. Um, I've had to, to get my meaning. I've had to drill one layer below and it's been just absolutely wonderful for me. It's been soul affirming. So I still love the game. Um, I'm not in any, I'm not a journalist. I'm a writer as such. I am interested in pioneers and, 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 and breakthrough stories that that's my core interest. Um, so I don't have to, I'm not on the beat. I don't have to, well, as soon as I saw Phil Gould's tweet for me, that was cathartic. It was like, it's not about this ridiculous COVID nonsense that we're being spoon fed and wouldn't pass the pub test that you charged out against all doctors advice to restart the game and lauded yourself as the one, you know, some people stretched it out to say they were responsible for the Olympics. If rugby league hadn't gone so early and provided that front runner template for other sports to go from that guy to rugby union, the hundred is playing right now union and we are the shyest most health conscious risk averse code in the world in the matter of 12 months it's just too much of a stretch and we're being fed this they've been in the bubble player fatigue what about letting wheelchair and women go or what about you know treating it like a military mission where only single men get asked first and we know no family guys are going to be in the bubble eternally there are some people who just want to play for their country who have been brought up that in all sports playing for your country is the highest honour and would give anything to do what the boomers just did, a disparate group of guys coming together, the Italians. Um, so, yeah, it's, 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 it's blown my mind. Um, and at least we know it's about some higher, higher power play and nothing to do with you know, the doctor saying someone will definitely catch COVID. I mean, what absolute gibberish is that, to say it definitively? Um, yep, it's a, it's a hostile takeover. There's no doubt. Okay, before we go, um, Patrick, where can people find you? I don't want people to, I don't want people necessarily to buy the book off anyone else if we're going to have a chat after this about me stocking it. But uh, where can people follow you, and and, and where can they um, read about um, the Big O? The Big O dot Kiwi is the website, um, and we will stock some with um, with 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 you, Steve, to service that uh, UK market. Um, and I've written this, this is a love letter to rugby league. And it's also a love letter to England for starting this game that I love as well. So there's a big tribute to those 22 men uh, who came together in 1895 and took the plunge for something we're still getting extraordinary delight from today. So from a big chunk of Australians, we love what England brings to the table. And, you know, we, we align with the Northmen in values and, you know, it, it, stoic principles. And uh, that's why I don't like what's just recently happened is so out of alignment with the fundamentals of rugby league, but the big O doc Kiwi, um, if you're in, if you're in Australia and white line fever, just, you know, keep following Steve because he'll have some copies jettisoned there very soon. It's been a pleasure. It's a surprise that we've never spoken before. I, I don't know how that happened, but um, a, a real pleasure. And we're going to stop the live stream now and have a bit of a chat off air. Thanks everybody for uh, joining us. Um, if you enjoyed the interview, how about you follow the channel on Facebook, on Facebook, whatever channel you're watching. Um, and, you know, if you're listening, then uh, please subscribe on, uh, on Apple and Patreon, patreon.com forward slash white